Um, we're going to be in uh, the Gospel of Luke this morning. So if you don't mind, in your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 19. And we're going to be looking at a parable. And uh, one other thing that I wanted to mention, uh, how many of you know Larry and D. Bell? Larry and D. Bell? All right. Thomas Road Baptist Church, uh, this past Sunday, Patty and I, we were sitting right beside them, Thomas Road Baptist Church. We went out to dinner, uh, lunch afterwards with them. They, they bring greetings as well. And so, wonderful people. Uh, one of the things that Patty and I do, uh, we get together with people, but we like to play cards, and we like to play a card game called Rook. Anybody played Rook? All right, look at that, all you hicks out there. <laughs> So uh, if you go to different places in the world, you say, we play rook, and they're like, we never heard of that. Uh, but we, we know about it in West Virginia and Kentucky, but uh, we have fun with them. Uh, but this morning, I want to talk about this parable, but before I do, <clears throat> just a little bit about my background. Uh, I mentioned that I met Patty there. Oh, and here are my nephews over here. Justin, raise your hand, and, and Jared, raise your hand, and their families, they're right there with them. And uh, they're here supporting the family as well. I told both of the boys, I, I needed somebody to preach to this morning, so thanks for coming, guys. We're <laughs> going to be directing some of this attention to you. Uh, but I met Patty at Liberty, and uh, we have two boys, uh, Ryan and Andrew, our oldest. Ryan is a pastor in upstate New York. And these are numbers that you, know, you have a hard time processing. Patty and I, we will celebrate our 40, I've got to think for a second here, 42nd our 42nd wedding anniversary in May. How about that? 42nd, 42. But our oldest son is 40. Our youngest is 33. Uh, he's, our oldest is a pastor. Our youngest is not married yet, so you can pray for him. Um, sometime it'll happen. But uh, I went to Liberty. I met uh, some people there. Uh, wonderful spiritual environment uh, at Liberty at the time. My RA was Dave Early. And uh, we got together and then we started talking about what are we going to do once we graduate. And we said, well, let's go start a church together. And we started looking around the map, where to go. And he was from Ohio. You know what I'm saying? He was from Ohio. And uh, we ended up going to Columbus, Ohio, uh, a little subdivision of, outside of Columbus called Gehanna. It's where the airport is, if you've ever flown out of there. And I was there for 18 years, two years in preparation, so 20 years total in a church plant. And I was the Christian education pastor. I was the discipleship pastor, the small group pastor, uh, assimilation pastor. We wore a bunch of different hats there. Our church really grew very quickly. Uh, we were about 2,300 people whenever I left. And I travel a little bit. Uh, this week I'll be in Indianapolis at a church. I'll be uh, another church in Orville. Uh, just two weeks ago I was in a church in Pittsburgh. And I want to just tell you this, Todd, and new, uh, uh, Fellowship, I almost said New Life Family. Fellowship Family, this is a good church. All right, turn to your neighbor and say, this is a good church. It is. It's a good church. I've been around a little bit. This is a good church. Uh, so, yeah, give yourselves a hand there. <laughs> uh, and, you know, what the facilities that you have here, the team that you have here, I got to spend some time with them. Uh, but then the Lord, after 20 years, I wrote out my second half life purpose statement, and that was to be a multiplier of multipliers. And the Lord led me uh, to Liberty University. And I've been there for 20 years. Uh, but uh, the time that I've been there, I've also been an associate pastor at Thomas Road Baptist Church. With, I worked with Dr. Jerry Falwell for a while, and now with Jonathan. Uh, lots of different ministry opportunities there as well. But right now, I am the program director of the Master of Arts in Christian Ministry, uh, a 36-hour degree, and I teach full-time at Liberty University. And one of the things that I do at Liberty University is I give a lot of exams. Now, how many of you like exams? Can I see your hands? Aha, uh -huh, the, the weird ones among us, a few hands. <laughs> now, let me just ask this question. On a scale of 1 to 10... Uh, and we're going to talk about final exam this morning because we're going to look at a passage that seems to imply that there is going to be a final exam. So whether you like it or not, there is going to be a final exam. We're all going to stand before Jesus Christ one day. But on a scale of 1 to 10, 1 being I hate final exams and 10 being I don't mind final exams, what would you say? What would you say? How many would you say uh, on, the, on a scale of 1 to 10, 1, I hate final exams? Can I see your hand? How many of you would say, number 10, I don't really mind final exams? Can I see your hand? And the weird ones among us again. 
So there we have it. But this passage that we're going to look at, it, it sets itself up just a little bit like a final exam because there's some questions on there. Now, the number one question that I get from my students when I'm teaching, uh, sometime during the semester and we're going through the notes or I'm lecturing and they're taking notes, they will kind of stop me and they will ask me a question. Anybody want to know what the question might be? Will this be on the final exam? And then they start paying attention uh, because they want to know whether or not it's going to be on the final exam. So now, how many of you are going to have a bad dream tonight because I was talking about final exams? Have you ever had that, that dream? How many of you have had that dream where you show up and you're like, oh man, I forgot all about this? I've actually had that happen with students who forgot or they didn't have it scheduled and they show up for an exam on exam day totally unprepared. It's not a good day for them. But here are a couple things about uh, final exams. They're usually tough. They're usually comprehensive, which means that they cover all of the material. And our whole life, Hebrews says, our whole life is open and laid bare before the eyes of whom we have to deal. But they're meant to measure whether or not we know the material and what we did. And they're usually meant to hold us accountable. I call my exams learning instruments. My students don't like that term, learning instruments, because we're going to learn, the two of us are going to learn whether or not the information that I have been teaching on, whether or not they are picking that up on that and putting that into practice. And so final exams, and I've given hundreds of exams. And uh, they uh, range in really very tough, but one of the things that I do is I give the students the questions that are going to be on the exam ahead of time. Now, how many of you would like to take a final exam that way, right? You already have the questions. Now, the problem is they're essay, the, and you have to write a lot. And we're in a digital age right now, right? You should see these students take out a pen and, stri uh, and, and start writing. Within just a few minutes, they're doing this, right? Oh, my hand, you know, they're not just used to writing, but they have the questions ahead of time. It's just that you have to study in preparation for the final exam. That's what this passage is going to be teaching us today. We have a question that's going to be on our final exam from Jesus Christ himself. Stephen Covey wrote a book called Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And uh, the number one habit of a highly effective a person is to begin with the end in mind. So let's just take a minute here and think about this. 2 Corinthians 5.10 says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ to determine what we have done in our lives. Now, for the believer, we're secure. We know that we, uh, Romans 8, nothing will separate us from the love of Christ. But also for the believer... We'll look at a passage, a correlation passage, correlation passage here this morning. It says that we're going to be judged on what we have done, though. And so we want to be able to stand before Jesus and give an account. Now, as we look at this passage, and we're going to be in Luke 19, verse 11. But as we look at this passage, it's a parable. And what I want you to do is, if you have a concordance, I've got one. This is a, one of the bigger Bibles that I carry. But in the back of the Bible, we call it the back of the book, there's a concordance. And maybe you have this, maybe you don't, but I, mine does. Uh, it talks about parables. There are about 30 different parables in the New Testament. And these parables are designed to teach us something about life in the kingdom. They're designed to teach us about the king. And they're also designed to teach us about what we are supposed to do as servants. And so as we look at these parables, and I'm going to take my glasses out at this point. Uh, because I am a professor. Uh, there are parables about the sower, the tares, the mustard seed, the leaven, the hidden treasure. If you remember these, the pearl of great price, the dragnet, net, the unmerciful servant, labors in the vineyard, the two sons, the wicked husband, the ten virgin, the talents. And this is similar to that one. But all these parables have characters, objects, and events. And as we look at this, parable in Luke 19, we're going to figure uh, uh, about the characters, object, objects, and events. Now, this parable in, in Luke 19 is similar to the parable in Matthew 25. The, the parable in Matthew 25 is called the parable of the talents. And they're similar, but there are some things that are not the same. In the parable of the talents, they're, you're, they're given differing amounts, 
They're giving five talents and three talents and one talents. In this parable, all the servants are given one mina. And that shows us that everybody has one thing to give to the Lord. Uh, and so as we look at these similarities and, and dissimilarities, there, we also see that there's different amounts. In the parable of the talents, a talent is, a, is worth about $500,000. And so if you had five talents, that's about $2.5 million. Now, when I was, uh, I've preached on this passage before a few years ago, I, I looked it up and the talent was worth about $360,000, but now it's worth $500,000. So we've got Biden economics going on here, don't we? <laughs> This inflation thing <laughs> that's taken. So it's worth about, if you had five, $2.5 million. A mina is worth about $10,000. So before you say, well, I'd, I'd rather have a talent. What if I told you that if I put $10,000 in your house right now and, and I hid it in your house and all you had to do is go to your house and find it. A lot of people would leave right now. <laughs> $10,000. It's worth something. And so we have to keep that in mind. But everybody is given one in this, in, this, in this passage. And so we're going to pick up the narrative in verse 11. But the context of this is this is about a week and a half or two weeks before Jesus is crucified. And he's on the road from Jericho up to Jerusalem. And he's at the house of Zac Zacchaeus. And there's a large crowd there gathered. And the disciples, they had a ongoing misunderstanding about the kingdom. And the ongoing misunderstanding about the kingdom was that the kingdom was going to be set up immediately. And they kept vying for positions and to be on the right hand and the left hand of Jesus. And they, they just thought that it was going to happen immediately. But Jesus is going to have to correct their misunderstanding and give them this parable. Verse 11. And while they were listening to these things, he went to, on to tell a parable because he was near Jerusalem. And here it is again, the misconception. They supposed that the kingdom of God was going to appear immediately. And Jesus talking here, he said, therefore, a certain nobleman, if, you're, if you underline or take notes in your Bible, you can circle that or underline that. The nobleman in this parable is Jesus. So he's going to go ahead and tip the cards forward there, this nobleman. And he's going to tell them this idea of the kingdom is delayed. He went to a distant country to receive a kingdom for himself and then return. Now, this was not unusual as far as the Roman governments were concerned during that time. If you conquered a city or a territory, you would send a governor to that territory, a prefect, and they would take control of that, that uh, country or that, 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 that land, that uh, city. And so they kind of thought this was, the, uh, this was familiar to them. And Jesus was going to go away, but then he was going to call back. He was going to come back. Verse 13, and he called 10 of his slaves, and that, uh, you want to cir circle or underline that, and slaves is you and me. Uh, Jesus talks about when we've done everything that we're supposed to do, we should consider ourselves as unworthy slaves. If you know Christ Jesus, you're a servant. He gave them 10 minas and said to them, and here it is, do business with this until I come back. This is like me as a professor saying, this is going to be on the final exam. Make sure you pay attention to this. Do business with this. But there's a group of category here. You have the slaves and you have a different category here. The citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, we do not want this man to reign over us. And I mentioned a minute ago, this is just about a week and a half out of Jesus going into Jerusalem and appearing before Pilate. And whenever he appears before Pilate, he goes like this. He says, here's your king. And the crowd yells back, we have no king but Caesar, and we do not want this man to rule over us. So he's predicting that this is going to happen to Jesus this, this person, this nobleman. But, verse 15, it came about that when he returned. Now, how many of you are looking forward to the return of Jesus Christ? Can I see your hand and putting this world back in right shape? We live in a broken world with broken systems and broken governments and broken people. One day, Christ is going to ret return. After receiving the kingdom, he ordered, here we go again, this is the the examination, he ordered that these slaves to whom he had given the money, he called to him in order that he might know what business they had done. Now, I mentioned a minute ago that parables have a tendency to sometimes be tough. And I'm going to tell you, this is a tough parable. 
This parable is reminding us that there is a king, he has a certain character, there are slaves, and there are responsibilities. In order to know what business they had done, verse 16, and the first appeared saying, Master, your mina has made ten minas more. And here's what we want to hear from Jesus. And he said to him, well done, good slave, because you've been faithful in a very little thing, be in authority over ten cities. The second came saying, Master, uh, your mina, master, has made five minas. And he said to him also, and you are to be over five cities. And so there's, there's examination and there is reward that is given to these faithful servants. However, in both of the parable of the talents and the parable of the minas, there is this category of person who comes to Jesus and says, Master, behold your mina, which I kept put away in a handkerchief. In the parable of the talents, the person actually says, I took what you gave me and I hid it and I buried it in the earth because I was afraid of you. And this is the, the person, he says the same thing here. I was afraid of you, verse 21. Interesting to note here that he knew because you are an exacting man. He knew what the character was of this nobleman. You take up what you did not lay down and reap what you did not sow. And he said to him, by your own words, I will judge you. You worthless slave. Now, this word for worthless here in the original is the same thing in the Beatitudes where it says that when salt has lost its savor, it's good for nothing. Did you know that I am an exacting man, taking up what I did not lay down and reaping what I did not sow? Then why? Why didn't you put the money in the bank and actually just receive some interest and collect it with interest? And here's the, the judgment. And he said to them, to the bystanders, rather, take the mina away from him and give it to the one who has ten minas. And they said to him, Master, this is not fair, basically. He has ten minas already. I tell you, the master's talking, that to everyone who has shall more be given. But from the one who does not have, even what he does have shall be taken away. Now, you could draw an arrow uh, from verse 27 to verse 14. I have an arrow in my Bible. Verse 14 says, his citizens hated him. Verse 27 says, but these enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slay them in my presence. Now I mentioned earlier that the, the characters in this uh, parable is the, are, it's the nobleman and the, the two slaves that were faithful and then this category of, of person. The two slaves that were faithful are you and me. And we have responsibilities and we're going to use those uh, time and talent and, and opportunities and gifts that we have to be faithful and serve the Lord. But this category of people is probably a category of person, a person that doesn't know Christ. Because the judgment, the punishment is to bring them here in my presence. And Matthew 25 is, is to cast them out into uh, utter darkness. If you're here this morning and you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. I'm here as a pastor, as an elder, as a, a person in, in the church, the body of Christ, to encourage you, make sure you know Jesus and make sure you give your life to Him. It's that important. The King is returning. That's the first thing that I want to talk a little bit about. But as we get into the notes this morning, you take your notes out, uh, if you will, and there's seven things that I wanted to talk about this morning, and you can fill in the blanks as we go along here. And I think there's going to be a PowerPoint up there. Yes, very good. Here are some lessons that we can learn. The main lesson is that the kingdom is delayed. And the second lesson is do business with this until I return. Study. Make sure you're preparing. First point that we want to make from, from the text is the master is an equal opportunity employer. Now, if you're like me, years ago, I worked for UPS uh, when I was in school, and we had a sign up on the wall, and it said, this place was an equal opportunity employer, a place of, that, that has equal opportunity laws. How many of you have ever seen that, line, that sign, equal opportunity? This is what's happening in this parable, is that every slave gets one mina. And so we have opportunity, and the mina is an, is an illustration, rather, of a spiritual ability. And we'll talk more about that in, in, a, in a minute. But we see in Ephesians 4, uh, verse 7 and 8, and uh, you don't need to turn there. I'll just read it to you really quickly here. 
But in Ephesians 4, it says that Christ, when He ascended on high, He gave gifts to people, to His servants. And let me read it again. But, but to each one of us, grace was given, charis, the, the idea for gift, was given according to the measure of Christ's gifts. Therefore, it says, when He ascended on high, He led captive a host of captives. And here it is, He gave gifts to men. I want you to get the, the word picture here of what's happening. When Jesus died on the cross and He rose again victorious, as He is ascending back into heaven, He is going to distribute to His children supernatural abilities to do something inside the kingdom of God. And that's you and me. It's a spiritual gift. And we'll talk more about that in just, just a second. But for every believer, you have at least one spiritual gift. And there's a list of them in Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12. In Romans 12, there's the gift of mercy, the gift of helps, the gift of administration, the gift of uh, exhortation, the gift of leadership. There's a list of gifts. And you need to find out what your gift is. Now, my wife tells me sometimes that I have a, a spiritual gift, and my gift is the gift of irritation. So, <laughs> how many else have that gift of irritation? <laughs> Turn to your neighbor this morning and say, you have a spiritual gift. Go ahead. You, it's very true. It's true. Now, don't say irritation, though, okay? Don't put that in there. <laughs> it's your responsibility. It's your responsibility to find out what that gift is. Uh, because the Master, is, in His ascension, He's giving to His children gifts. Now, consider Ephesians 2, 8, 9. Now, we know 2, 8, 9. For by grace you are saved through faith. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any person should boast. But verse 10, For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. When you come to know Christ, God is above the time-space uh, continuum line. He knows whenever you come to know Christ. But He has something in mind that He wants you to do inside the kingdom. And it's very important that you discover what that, your spiritual gift is and then serve. And this is part of the reason why you have this little pink sheet. That I, Pink sheet, that doesn't sound right. You get a pink sheet when you're fired, right? <laughs> you have this little sheet. I'm not going to call it pink anymore. Uh, we have this sheet is because this church wants to help you find a place of service. And we'll talk more about that in a second. Uh, number two. Secondly. The Master has clearly communicated His desires to us. And we have that phrase in verse 13, Do business with this until I come back. Now this is a stewardship that each of us have. Uh, the stewardship involves you finding your gift, discovering your gift. 1 Peter 4 says, uh, verse 10 and 11, As each one of you has received a spiritual gift, use it in serving Christ. Is each person, each believer... Use it in serving Christ. And then we have a, a responsibility in 1 Timothy 4. It says, do not neglect your gift. Now, the reason that this is so important, part of the reason this is so important, and we got to talk with the, the pastors and the elders of the church yesterday, but when Jesus is describing the church, and I'll get into the prophes professorial mode here for a second here, when Jesus is trying to understand, and Paul's trying to uh, interpret what does the church mean, he says in Ephesians 1.23, the church is his body. Paul says it to the Roman church, the church is his body, it's made up of many members. All of the members don't have the same function. But in order for the, the church to proper function, to, pro uh, to function properly, all the parts need to be working. And this is part of the goal that we have, and we teach our students to try and get everybody involved doing something inside the local church. Now, it works a little bit like this, and I, I, I get an illustration here. Just put two hands out in front of you, just like this. Two hands, all right? I want to see them, all right? Humor me. <laughs> here are the ministries and the programs and the opportunities of the church, and here are the people. And we want to connect these two things together. Okay, go ahead and put them together. And if you do it just right, you can do the people and the steeple and all of those things. But what ends up happening is this church cannot function properly 
without the, the functioning of each individual part. Let me add, put it to you this way. How many of you want all the parts of your body working? Can I see your hand? Amen. Well, there we have it. The church is the body of Christ. All the parts need to be working. You need to be using your spiritual gift. And they talk about that. Paul talks about that in Ephesians chapter 4. That when, what ends up happening in verse 16 of Ephesians 4, it says, From whom the whole body, being fitted together and held together by that which every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body up of itself in love. When each part is doing its job, the body of Christ functions properly. It's very important that you discover your spiritual gift and use your spiritual gift. Thirdly, though, in this parable, and I've already talked about this a little bit, and I'll use it in a, in a, a, a dual sense here. The, the master's servants reject his authority, reject his authority and do not obey his mandate. Verse 14 says, we do not want this man to reign over us. Now, as I mentioned, this is probably the unbeliever, but in many Christians' lives, and this was true in my life when I was growing up, I got saved when I was nine. Little country church, uh, Mingo County. I was talking with a, a gentleman in the back back here, and when I mentioned Mingo, Mingo County, he's like, oh, that's a rough part of their territory down, 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 down there. <laughs> For some reason, he's got that reputation. I got saved at Parsley Bottom Free Will Baptist Church, nine years old. And was baptized. But during my high school years, I strayed from the Lord. And I did not want Jesus to reign, to rule. I wanted to go where I wanted to go. I wanted to have my friends. I wanted to go to college where I wanted to go to school. And I was rejecting his authority. But I was, I was saved. And so one night, I was at Marshall University. Uh, any Marshall University people in here? There we go. I see that wave back there. We're pretty much mountaineers up here, aren't we? Mountaineers? Marshall. And uh, somebody from Campus Crusade knocked on my dorm room, and they were sharing the gospel with me. And I told them, I'm a believer. I don't look like one. I don't act like one. And I'm not talking like one. I'm ashamed to admit it. But they shared the gospel with me. They prayed for me. That night, I looked up at the ceiling, and I, I made a foxhole prayer to God. I said, God, if you let me get out of this mess that I put myself into by not following you, when I go home for the semester, I'll give my life to you. I, I'll, I'll surrender. So that's exactly what happened. I go home for Christmas break. My mom, godly mother that she is, I've got to stay away from that for a second. What would we do without her, a godly mother? invited me to church a New Year's Eve service where you light a candle, right? Signifying that you're going to live for the Lord that year. I went forward and I gave up. Now, I mentioned a minute ago that some of you are here that you don't know Christ, but some of you here are struggling with surrendering to his kingship. I made a statement that night. I said, God, I give up. I'll go anywhere and do anything that you want me to do. And that is the exact language of a slave, of a servant. And that is expected from each one of us. Romans 12, 1 and 2 puts it this way. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice which is your spiritual service of worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may experience the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Up until that time, 16, 17, 18 years, 19 years old, I was miserable. And so when I surrendered to God, uh, that was when my life changed. I yielded to the the authority of the king. I stop saying, I do not want this man to rule over me. Don't be in that category. Don't be in the category of rejecting Jesus as, as Lord and Savior, but don't be in the category of rejecting his leadership in your life. Fourthly, we see from this parable, the master is returning one day and he will call us into account. 
that he might know, verse 15 says, that he might know what business they had done. And I'll project something up here. Yeah. Looking at our world today, you know, Jesus said that he was going to go on a long journey. All right. So it's been 2,000 years. And looking at this, there are things that are occurring right now. And Hebrews uh, 10 says that we should encourage one another and all the more, get this next phrase, as you see the day approaching. Uh, turn to your neighbor and say, as you see the day approaching. All right. We can see it. Israel's in the land, 1948, 1967. They uh, occupy Jerusalem and they've got part of the Temple Mount, which they have to have in order to have the temple sacrifices. We'll see how that plays out. We know what happened uh, just a, a little while ago, surrounded by enemies. Uh, uh, they, they want to destroy the nation of Israel. And you, you think about this, this unnatural uh, hatred of the Jewish people that has existed for thousands of years. And we know why that is, because Satan wants to crush the people of God. And so we see that surrounded by enemies, persecution of Israel and Jewish people is increasing wars and rumors of wars. I mean, we got Ukraine and, and Russia and China and Taiwan. Everybody nod your head like this. These are all things that are going on. That's predicted in Matthew 24 famines. We just went through this whole thing with the pandemic, right? If you remember that about the supply chain and how the ships were out in the ocean and we couldn't get them in and, and you know, the grocery stores, plagues. We just went through the coronavirus. And, and, and if you do a little bit of reading about the gain of function research, there's a virus right now that is 15 times more deadly than the coronavirus. And they're doing gain of function research on it and why I cannot figure that out. Except to understand that in the book of Revelation, there are plagues that are going to be loosed upon the earth that's going to kill one third of humanity. It already exists. So let's be ready. Deadly plagues, push for a one world government. I, 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 read, I have a tendency to read too much, but there's something called the 2030 Agenda, a reset. Have you heard about the Great Reset? People are working on it right now to do away with the governments and so forth. One world currency. Uh, vaccination passports, worldwide travel, worldwide communication. And this is an interesting one that's popped up recently, right? UFOs? <laughs> I thought we weren't supposed to believe in UFOs. And they're like, eh, it happens. Meh. <laughs> Figure it out. I don't know. Increased godlessness in uh, Russia and China potentially gaining, uh, joining forces rather. And here's the point here from this. The master has, has been on a long journey. It's been 2,000 years. When we can see these things, encourage one another all the more, as you see these things happening. We were, we were talking last night. You realize that the, the uh, wise people in the time of Jesus, they knew when Jesus was coming the first time. We can look and see some of the signs of, uh, of his nearness coming the second time. Fifthly, the master expects us to be fruitful. Here's the answer. One mina has made 10 minas more. And so we see this in verses 16 through 19. The first appeared saying, Master, your mina has made 10 minas more. And here's what we want to hear. Well done, good slave, because you've been faithful in a very little thing, be an authority. There will be rewards gained and rewards lost. If you have your Bible, uh, you do, but turn over to 1 Corinthians for a minute there. We'll, we'll, we'll take a look at another passage that I mentioned to you earlier. But in 1 Corinthians 3, I want to read a section to you to help you understand that the Master expects us to be fruitful. And we're going to look at this in 1 Corinthians 3 here in just a second here. As we're being fruitful, though, that what God wants us to do, there's a progression in our development. Hebrews 5 puts it this way, that by this time you ought to be teachers. You have need again someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God. You've come to need milk and not solid food. God wants you to grow up in all aspects into Him. Ephesians 4 says that we are to grow up in all aspects into Him. Turn to your neighbor again this morning. This is a professor thing here that we do. Turn to your classmate 
and say, you need to grow up. Some of you are taking too much joy in saying you need to grow up. That's the fifth point. God expects, expects us to be fruitful. He wants us to be so fruitful, the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of using our gifts, the fruit of other people coming to know Christ. And we, we just have to be busy about the, the work of the kingdom. And we come to the sixth point. The master will eva evaluate us, rather, in, this, in the next life based upon what we do in this life. And verse 22 says, again, what did you do with what I gave you? I've already quoted 2 Corinthians 5.10, for we must all be appear before the judgment seat of Christ. But we see this passage, back to 1 Corinthians 3, we see a passage, verse 12 for, uh, says, for if now if any man builds upon the foundation with gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, this person has been busy. Each man's work will become evident, for the day will show it because it is to be revealed with fire. And the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. If any man's work which he has built upon it remains, he will receive, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, he shall suffer loss. This means that when the king returns, we're going to be called into account. And if we have been faithful in using what he has given to us, we will receive rewards. And there's a whole bunch of teachings as far as rewards are in heaven and the crowns. And we're not going to spend the time to go into that. But also rewards will be lost. C.T. Studd said this, only one life to live will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. As I said, this is a tough parable. Now, the seventh point is that the master will not accept weak excuses. Now, because he says, I'm an exacting man. And in, in, in a little bit later in 1 Corinthians, it says that we'll be, we're going to be judged for every idle word. Now, whenever I give a final exam, or an exam, I won't say final, but that's a little inexcusable. But sometimes when I give an exam, the person might come in and go, oh, no, I forgot all about that. As a professor, I will take a look at their circumstances. They might have been busy. They're, they have had illness in their family or whatever. And I, I will go, this is me. I'll go, that's okay. We can work it out. Uh, just take it in two days from now. Study a little bit harder. That's not what this parable teaches. This parable says that he is an exacting man. And we can't escape this final exam. And so whenever we think about this, we all have certain things that are given to us by God. All of us have the same amount of time. We have 168 hours in a week, 24 hours a day. And as far as the life in the kingdom is concerned, is, is how are you investing? How are you using that 168 hours in a week? I want, I want to challenge you with this. Spend your time in the kingdom. Spend your time working for the king. Get involved. Get in, involved. Uh, Jesus put it this way in Matthew 6. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. That's what we should be investing in, your time. Your talents, you've got abilities, you've got gifts. Uh, God has given you a supernatural ability to do something significant in the kingdom. What about your tithe? What about your treasure? Time, talent, treasure. You should be tithing. My wife and I, I we can, can just tell you early on in our marriage, we made a commitment to, to tithe, to give 10%. And God has blessed us beyond all that we could ask or think. It's amazing, uh, the blessings of God. But you should do it anyway. And your testimony, you should share your story with your friends and your neighbors and uh, associates and classmates. Share what God has done. And then in 1 Corinthians 4, verse 2, it says that a steward needs to be found busy in the Lord's work. As I said to you that as we began this, this morning, parables are meant to teach us about life in the kingdom and the attitude and the character of the king, but it's also... It's meant to teach us about our responsibilities right here, right now. This parable teaches that the kingdom has been delayed. The king is going to return one day. But in the interim time period, 
He gives to his servants, each one of us as believers, he gives us abilities and time and talent and treasure. We should be actively involved in that. And this is where I want to take you out. I want you to take this piece of paper out. It's not a pink sheet, so we're not going to call it a pink sheet anymore. I want you to take this sheet of paper out. And these are some of the opportunities that this church, the body of Christ, has. And we'll, I'm just going to do this. Look at me for a second here. This is the people in the church. These are the ministries and the opportunities that this church has for you to get connected somewhere. And here's what I would like to do. I want to ask you to do this, this is a, as a favor to me. I want you to identify where you might, M-I-G-H-T, you might be willing to serve. Okay? And with a number one, I might be willing to serve here. Number one, I'd like to, this is my first choice. Number two, and number three. And maybe you already are serving, and that's great, man. We love servants uh, in, the, in the kingdom. I tell people all the time, if you're in the nursery and in, in preschool area and you're serving there, there are treasures in heaven. <laughs> I believe you're going to get a big old crown <laughs> because it's not my gift, that's for sure. But if you have the gift of mercy or helps or teaching or exhortation or administration or leadership, look this, this list over and say, I might be willing to help out there. And in a minute, Todd is going to come forward and we're going to collect these. And so what I want you to try and do is identify as a servant where you might be willing to serve King Jesus. Is that, is that fair? Let's, let's nod our head like this. Is that, do you understand what I'm saying? All right, let's do that. And here's, uh, as I close this morning, this is a little bit like a call in the book of Acts. It's called the Macedonian Calls, like come over here and help us. This is the Fellowship Bible Call. Come over and help us. Get involved. Three questions for you as I close. How can you pre prepare for your final exam? That is by getting involved and getting busy right now. The answer is, if you don't know Christ as your Lord and Savior, ask Jesus to come into your heart, your life, forgive you of your sin. Turn your life over to Him. Admit your sins. Believe in Jesus. Call upon Jesus. Commit your life to Him. That's the first step. Secondly, Maybe you're like me. You are like, mm, God, I don't want you, as a 19-year-old, I don't really want you in charge. Maybe you just need to surrender. And thirdly, is maybe you just need to look at yourself as a servant inside the kingdom, and you've got responsibilities. And so, if you will, I'm going to ask the ushers to come forward uh, at this time. And we're going to pass the plates around. You can fold it, but I want you to put your name on it, phone number. Somehow we can get in touch with you. And uh, come forward at this time, and we're going to take a little offering. And as we do that, here's, here's, here's part of the offering. Romans 12, 1 and 2 says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present, hang on a second, we'll pass those in just a second, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, which is your spiritual service of worship. Sometimes we talk about worship. What is worship? Worship is offering up all that you are, all that you have, all of your abilities, all of your talents. You're offering it up to the King of Kings. Let me uh, pray for us right now, and then we'll, we'll uh, conclude the service. Father, thank you for the passage of this parable. Thank you for the King. Thank you for what it teaches us about life in the kingdom, and I pray for each servant here today, every one of us, God, that you would take us, take what we have to offer, and bless it. And God, we know you love the church. You love this church, and you want to see this church become the visible hands and feet of Jesus on this earth right now. But we know that it requires every person submitting and surrendering to you and saying, God, here I am. Take me and use me for the kingdom. And that's what we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.